there is no hopeless area in your life. There is no area of your life that is beyond redemption. God chose us and, and said, I have set my gaze on you, daughter. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to come here in your beautiful church and share God's word with you. It's such an honor for me and for my family. We're so excited. I come in the name of Jesus whom we all love, yes, and uh, we come from Haven Fellowship in Bangalore, so everyone's been praying for this, we've been very excited about this, and I want to tell you something before I share what God asked me to share with you. Every day, God has asked me to get on my knees and speak to Him and also hear from Him. So we know we have to pray, we have to worship. We know, we know to sing to God, but he also said you need to hear from me also. So for the past year or so, I've been writing down things that he've, he's been telling me. And it's things like, follow me, hear me, be kind. Sometimes it's uh, towards my family because I'm living with them. Uh, listen to what they're saying today. So I'll take it for that day and I'll try to keep that in mind the whole day. And it's always so appropriate, so powerful, and has changed my life dramatically. Now, when I heard that I could come here and speak with y'all, I was like, oh, I, I don't know these people. I don't know how they are. And uh, in our Church Haven Fellowship, you know, there's some observation that goes on. And okay, I think God would say this, and God will tell me something, and it's kind of informed in a way. But here, I was like, hmm, I, I try to watch some of your services online. It's like, oh, awesome. God, what do you want me to tell? Because we are here for God. We're not really here for any person. We're here to hear from God. So I'm asking God, what do you have to say to Bangalore Revival Church, specifically to each of us? What is that one thing that you want to tell? And he gave this, uh, normally he gives one sentence, okay, maybe four or five sentences. He started, and he continued, and he continued, and he continued, and he, I was writing one page, it went into the next page. And so today I'm going to share with you what he's saying to you today. Then, <laughs> amen, amen. I'll just read it out for you first. And then we'll go deeper into it. So do listen carefully. These are words from him. Um, if you want to know, like, is it really from him or she's only telling, you can check each of the lines. Do they match the word of God? I see that they all do. You can even see later. I, I think you all record these. You can go one by one and check each word is there in the Bible. So he is telling you this today. Bangalore Revival Church, I want you to praise and worship me, God. I want you to seek me and find me, to know me deeply like a friend. I want to reveal your thoughts to you and to tell you my thoughts. I want you to serve me and to be served by me. I want you to honor me and to see me ahead of you and to come to me. I want you to want me, to give me everything you have, to trust me, to delight in me, to chase after me, to bow before me, to come before me, to adore me, to hallow me, to deserve my praise, to sit at my table and to eat with me. I want you to know that I, 
I'm Jehovah Rapha, the healer. Praise God. The God who heals, that I am your protection and provider. Father, not foe. I will deliver you from every trouble if you come to me. I will keep you in good health till the day that you are supposed to know me deeper in sickness and to be fully known by me after death. I want you to know me and to be with me all the days of your lives. I will be waiting for you until you decide you want to give your lives to me. You must if you want to live. Oh, praise God. Let's pray and we'll continue. Father, thank you for your word, your precious word to your precious people. Speak to our hearts, O oh God, and reveal your thoughts to us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. I just love what he has told you because it, it's so fueled by his love. He wants each of us to be more than best friends. It's like he's calling us into marriage with him. And there's so much of a desire for each of us here to not be just the average believer, but to go all in. Now, nobody will call us so uh, deeply if they don't want all of us all in. So it's, it, when I was writing this for you, I was just, I was like crying, like, oh, this is so beautiful, this is so lovely. I'm so excited for you. So let's go little by little. Uh, this can take many months to, <laughs> to talk about. But we will try to see the, the main things that he wants to break down today. Starting off with praise and worship. As you all rightly started, praising and worshipping the Lord. You all know how to praise. I love my uh, African brothers and sisters. They, you know, their praise is something so awesome about that. <laughs> Praise God for you. And I love my Indian brothers and sisters with the deep humility and the deep, you know, adoration, the sincerity, both put together. Awesome combo. <laughs> <laughs> so you, we know how to praise and worship in song, for sure. More than many. But praise and worship him goes beyond music. It is a lifestyle. It is a, when the job is going bad, I worship you. When someone I love has passed away, I worship you. When God has given me success, I worship you. I praise you. So every moment, we have to be like, uh, think of Job, incredible example of worship. Ten children died. His great flock was killed. His houses were destroyed. Everything he had, in one shot, do, 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 do. And what did he say? You would think, in even a believer, you would think, yeah, they would obviously <laughs> bang the wall or something. They would be on the verge of not knowing how to live anymore. But this man, he's grieving. He goes on the floor, he puts ash on his head. But what he says? Blessed is the name of the Lord. I came naked into this world. I will go naked. Whatever God has given me in between was his blessing to give and take away. Blessed be the Lord. We sang, I worship you. You are God. You are Messiah. You are wonderful. Beautiful words. Take the songs that you love and make it go into each part of your day, no matter what happens. And you will be living a lifestyle of praise and worship, which is very beautiful to God. God wants us to seek and find Him. You may think, excuse me, I am in the church. 
I have long ago found him. I am a deep believer. What are you saying? I think uh, one of the deepest things of a human being is to be found. To be known intimately, not for what my work says or what my qualifications say or for what my family is, but to be known for who I am in a way that I myself may not know. I may not know how to tell you who I am. I want to be known inside. God is saying, know me in his insides. Seek and find. Um, let's take a barometer as St. Paul. In the book of Acts, he is saying he's in chains. He is, uh, he is going to where chains await him. Imagine that you knew you were sentenced to prison and you're going into that region. The Holy Spirit gave you a vision of being imprisoned and you're going to that region. And he's telling, I go to where chains await me, but none of these things move me. Imagine that. I read this when there was something happening in our home. My brother was uh, suddenly losing his mind. And I don't know if, if you all know, he's visually challenged, so that itself is like, okay, it's a blessing if we can praise God in that. We got used to that. Suddenly this happened. And then we were having uh, physical violence at home all of a sudden, in a home which is very gentle and loving. Suddenly there's like, <sighs> and those things which I've never seen in my life, not personally. And I read this, this man, he's been whipped, stoned, and he says, none of these things move me. They don't even, they don't even, they don't even, he's so firm in Christ. So if we have not got that yet, if little, little things can move us, if a little bad day makes us sad, depressed, discouraged, anxious, something's not going our way, we get frustrated. It is natural, but God is supernatural. So if we haven't had that, that firm, unshakable faith that we see these disciples had, we see people in the Bible have, we need to seek and find it in Jesus. Know me deeply like a friend. What you do with your friends, you go, you hang out with them, you try to figure out all, all about them. Do that with God. So much treasure in this word. Ask him. He said, you, you ask me, I'll tell you the mysteries of the universe. Jeremiah 33, 3. I, I, I know I like to go and I'll sit in the balcony. I ask him, um, not just what do you have for my life? But things like, why did you make the stars? Now, what are their names? Now, what, what do you know them by? Those kind of questions. You have questions in your heart that you've been longing to know. Ask God. I want to reveal your thoughts to you. What does that mean? Luke 2. Luke 2, 40 something says, uh, to Mary, it was said, a sword shall pierce your very soul that the thoughts of man shall be revealed. It was talking about Jesus as the sword, the word of God. You may think, oh, that's a very scary verse. But uh, like I said, one of the deepest things we want is to be known truly. And Jesus is that sword. He's a kind of gentle sword. So it's kind of an oxymoron. But in the best way, he's gentle and he's fiery. When we know him, he just slices us open. And we are who we are in front of him. That's why I was here and I was just... Because <laughs> I could see myself in his eyes. There is so much filth. And still... He's seeing me through Jesus, and he's seeing me white. He's seeing me flawless, and it was just too much. It was too much to handle. 
I want to tell you your thoughts. Why? Because we often think, um, I'm doing what I have to do. No, I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. I'm worshiping. I'm going to church. Everything's fine. He wants to tell us what we really are. And he wants to tell us who he really is. There's this word which has millions of thoughts of him. We can start here. And there's millions that he wants to tell us specifically. He wants to tell you about your day. He wants to tell you about your friends. He wants to tell you about the work he has. These are all things. We go to other people and ask. We can just ask God. And he will tell. I want you to serve me. And be served by me. Serve me, we know what to do. We have to give our life to God. And everything we do, we honor him. What is this to be served by me? This is blasphemy. <laughs> but uh, it reminds me of Jesus when he was tempted by the devil in Matthew 4. It says, after he was tempted, angels came and ministered to him. Wow. We think of ministry as like this kind of thing, no? You, you tell the word of God. What is ministering by God? At the core, ministry is serving. Serving. You can go to a restaurant and you see people serving you. They're giving you things. What the angels did to Jesus, I don't think they came and gave him some theology class. They would have come and they would have strengthened him. They would have refreshed him. They would have taken care of his hunger. He had fasted 40 days and nights. They would have encouraged him from the inside. God wants to do that for each of you today and all your life. We tend to go to our phones and to other people and to entertainment to get what God wants to give to us. And it's only found in him. I want you to honor me. So cool that this has been your theme this month. So you would know about this. What is it to honor God? I want you to see me ahead of you and come to me. What is that? It reminds me of Peter on the water. Can you imagine? Just We've heard this story, I'm sure. But can you imagine? It's a storm. And my mother, who has lived by the beaches all her childhood, her father was a lighthouse keeper, she would tell me that the, the waves could go like this, like this high. She has seen that up front. Can you imagine walking on that? Can you imagine one man walking on that coming towards you? You are screaming in the boat. The boat is going insane. Can you imagine one man coolly passing by? These people freaked out, thought it's a ghost. First of all, we're in a storm, now we're seeing ghosts. What is going on? Then Jesus reveals it's him. And Peter, I don't know, he's so bold. That's why he's the rock of the church. Peter's like, tell me also to come. Jesus says, come. And he starts working on that same water. As long as he's looking at Jesus, he's walking on the water. He's not realizing what he's doing. That has all taken second place. First place is Jesus. As soon as he's like, looks down, he starts drowning. Obviously, it's terrifying. Whatever you put your eye on, uh, we tend to become. You put your eye on the waves, you tend to become chaotic. You put your eye on the problem, you tend to become the problem. But you put your eye on Jesus, the problem solver. Amen. You tend to become like Jesus and you will walk on the water. So he's saying, look at me and come to me. See me. Look at your, uh, don't look at your life, don't look at your day, don't look at your stuff, don't look at the people, look at me. And that's it, that's all you need. Then he says, 
want me. We know we need God. That's one of my favorite songs. I need you more, more than yesterday. We know we need Him. We can see how weak we are. But do we want Him is a much harder question. There's so many times when I've struggled with sin. The reason I've struggled is because I didn't want to stop sinning. Anyone relate? Yes. So, okay. Because that's a horrible thing when you actually want to keep sinning. But when you want God, He makes it very easy. He shows the way out. He shows Himself. He satisfies us. So, how to want God if we don't want Him? I don't know if there's anyone like that here. But in case, you know, you're, you're in some kind of addiction, some kind of habit, which you know you're not supposed to, but you just can't help it, and you've, you started loving that. How do you want God instead in that situation? Taste and see that the Lord is good. We had a communion. I was looking at the glass, and every time I'm amazed that a precious God would send his son and let him bleed, let him die for me. When you taste God, he's like honey in the rock. He's like in a desert where there was nothing. You finally get a drink of water. That is God. And when you taste that, the more you taste him, the more you want him. I had a, a problem earlier where I didn't want to drink water. Very stupid problem. This is one of the basic needs of humans. And I didn't want water. I, even now I tell my parents, I give them so much trouble. I say, well, it's watery, so I don't want it. <laughs> and my father uh, happens to also have, have had that problem. And he had the privilege of experience to tell me, look, if you want surgery of removal of kidney stones, then you can continue as you are. If you don't want that, just might as well drink the water. So I was like, okay, I'll drink. I don't want surgery for sure. I'll drink. The more I drank, the more I wanted it. The more I had it, the more thirsty I became for it. And now I uh, apparently drink more water than my dad. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is the more you taste God, the more you want Him. And uh, your taste for other things starts fading away. People who, who stop eating chocolate, I'm not one of those people, they say the more you stop, you know, the, the less you need sugar. The more you stop eating sugar, the less you need sugar. So this, this will be a, like I said already, lifestyle of tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. If you want to want God, but you're not there yet, keep eating Him. <laughs> that was one of the controversial lines where the followers of Jesus were like, I'm done. I'm done, I'm going. <laughs> I don't know. This, this Jesus, He was doing so well. He was healing everybody. He was adored. He had many, many followers. And then one day He says, Eat me! Drink me. And they're like, oh, I don't know. This guy's mad. Bye. But then he told his disciples, I'm talking about the spirit, man. Can't you, all, can't you all make out? I'm talking about the spirit. The spirit is truth and the spirit is life. We are flesh, but we're also spirit. So much we look at our flesh. We're like, my flesh is hungry. Let me eat. My flesh wants to be uh, angry. Let me be angry. So much we listen to us, our flesh, but we forget that we're also spirit. And it's the spirit within us which longs, which feels lonely, which wants love. And we think somehow that by following the flesh, we'll help our spirit. But the only way you can help your spirit 
is by following the Holy Spirit. Amen. What does it say? Give me everything you have. You may think you have already. I had dedicated my life to God. Uh, how many years ago now? About four years ago. When this Haven Fellowship started, I knew, oh, you're going to talk about the Word of God, you better dedicate your life so that your, your actions match what you're saying. But every day he shows me there's more to give. There's more to give. You need to give your thoughts. You need to give your worries. You need to give uh, your favorite things. Everything. Give it to God. Trust God. I have major trust issues. So this was difficult. God, you know, my pet died long ago. I don't know if I can trust you now. I don't know. I mean, I thought you knew what I wanted, but it didn't happen. So I don't know if you, I can trust you. But God's saying, I want you to trust me. Because when you trust me, instead of fighting, fighting, when there's something dangerous happening, you will just let me lead you into life. Sometimes there's no time to, you know, argue with God and question Him. There's a place and a time for that. Sometimes you're in danger. You're just about to make a horrible decision. And that time He's like, trust me. And He's like, no, but why? No, but tell me what, what it is for. And you miss. And He's like, I didn't want you to go through that trouble. If you had just listened to me, you would have avoided that. Trust Him. The more you trust Him, the more you will know that it is worth trusting him. He's not one of those uh, guys who, who look very trustworthy and when you actually trust, it's like heartbreak or vice versa. One of those girls who look very trustworthy and you go and mm, mm. he's a God who is completely, utterly from every angle, whatever he tells you, 100% truth. Always. Delight in me, he says. Delight is a very strong word. I knew I had to read my Bible when I was a teenager, but I was confused when I read the Psalms when David was saying, I delight in your law. I was like, what is there to delight in the law? <laughs> do, not commit, do not commit adultery. I delight in your law. I was really confused. And I said, God, if, if he's enjoying this, I also want to enjoy. Otherwise, it's not worth it. It's not worth going around with a moping face. I have to not commit adultery. I have to not lie. I'll just do it because I'm supposed to do it and I'll get life. Otherwise, I'll go to hell. I don't want that kind of uh, superficial life. I want what David had. I want to be a woman after God's own heart. That or nothing. So I've been seeking God in that way. No, I want everything you have for me. Nothing less. And, and some people come to me and say, oh, you're so you know, fortunate. God has revealed himself like this to you. I'm so confused because he wants to work with every single person. He doesn't choose one person and be like, uh, to you only I will talk. Anyone who comes to him, he accepts. Whoever believes in Jesus shall have eternal life. Eternal life. Whoever, whoever, from wherever, in whatever situation. The Samaritan woman came, she had had five husbands. She was in a live-in relationship. And Jesus is sitting with her and talking with her. He loved her. He loved her. Thank you, Lord. So he's worth giving everything we got. Chase after me, he says. That's another very uh, passionate kind of word. We, we tend to chase after, you know, opposite gender. Okay. <laughs> that is a, oh, let's see what he's doing. Or let's see where she's going. That's, why do we chase what we chase? You may not be that kind of person. It may, be a, it may be an addiction. It may be something to do with something you're watching. It may be a project that you're chasing. Why do we chase what we chase? We somehow think there's a treasure in that which is worth chasing. It's worth 
being undignified for. God is saying, if you chase me, you'll find that treasure. And much more. Much more. Then he says, bow before me. Okay, not once, not on Sunday, but throughout your day. Let it be in subjection to who I am. Remember who I am. I am God. And you are made by me. So many times we act like we are God and God is helping us. Uh, God, I asked you yesterday to do this. Did you do it? You did it? No. When are you going to do it? It's like, I'm God. Bow before me. Come before me. God sits on his throne room. And his Holy Spirit goes everywhere. He sent his son, Jesus. But how do we go and meet a king? To go prepare ourselves, we go and we bow before the king. We do that for humans. If, there was a, if we were getting to meet a government official, we'd be like, okay, is everything proper? Do I have all my, uh, you know, Aadhaar card and whatever I need to meet this great, grand person? Do I get a gift? What can I give that is the best? And you'll go before me and give full respect. What about God? What about the king of kings? We are so, there is advantage in um, the new covenant where we can worship from anywhere, right? But it also comes with a, a con which is, mm, you know, sitting in the chair like this. God, you're so good, you're so good. <laughs> you're so awesome. There's no rule to how we worship. But he's saying, can you also like bow in your heart? Can you like subject yourself to me? Can you adore me? Can you hallow me? This is not for his pleasure only. He's not like fanning himself by all this. It's for our good. Because we were made by him. So the only way we can have life is to bow before him, to worship him. We were made for that. So when we're worshiping God, in honor and in fear of Him and adoration, we are like connecting with our purpose. Every other time we are a little disconnected and we are able to kind of survive until God decides, you know. But when we worship, we are connected. So it's for our good what He's saying. Deserve my praise. What does that mean? Ooh. God is only pleased by our faith. Because we have proven to him that we are way below his standard of holiness. He understood that long ago. He sent Jesus long ago. The only way you can please God is to have faith in a sinless Messiah. Is that much? Is that a lot to ask from us? He's not asking us uh, you know, to cut yourself five times, like how some, the, the worshippers of Baal did in the Bible, they would whip themselves and, mm, pain for my God. He's not asking that. He's not asking sacrifices, you have to get animals and sacrifice. He's not asking for money. He's not asking for your family. He's asking for faith. Just faith. We can do that. We can do that. Let's Let's ask God to give us the faith so much that he says, wow, I have never seen such faith in all the world. Do you recognize that marvel? There's uh, one, there are two places where it says Jesus marveled in the Bible. One place is he marveled at their unbelief. Now why I like this word is because I always thought Jesus could not be surprised. He knows everything. He knows our thoughts. So he, you, whatever you say is like, yeah, I know you were going to say that. So I thought he'll never be shocked, shaken, surprised by anything. But the word marvel means, wow, that's fresh, that's new. I've never seen anything like that. Now, what a thing it is to make God marvel. Amazing. So one place he marveled at the unbelief. He's like, 
I just ask for faith. That also they cannot, means I don't know. The second place is when he meets the centurion who says, you don't even have to come to my house to do this healing. Just say the word. He was far from that person's house. This man who is not in the Jewish clan, he's supposedly foreigner. At that time it was so, there were so many barriers, children of God and aliens. But this man from that side is saying, you stay where you are, one day away from my house, and you just speak it, and I know that my servant will be healed. And then Jesus says, wow, I have not seen such faith even in Jerusalem. So I ask God for that kind of faith to deserve his praise. That's a praise, that's the best praise you can get from Jesus. Wow, that's the kind of faith I've been looking for. Let's ask for that kind of faith. What is that faith? Just believing that he will do what he says he will do. That's it. Trust. He says, I want you to sit at my table and eat with me. How many of us like food? How many foodies here? Yes, yes, foodies. There's something so comforting about eating, right? It, it, it makes you happy, especially if it's your favorite food. It, it takes care of your hunger. God is saying, I want to feast with you. I want to celebrate with you. I want you to sit with me at my table. Imagine you're going into a king's uh, palace. It will be an awesome thing even to get inside the palace, no? Like, oh, I got entry, I'm so important. But imagine if the king says, come sit at my table, eat with me, I will pass the things to you, and we'll sit and talk. You'll faint off. I don't know, I would faint off. This is the creator of our bodies, of heaven and earth. He is saying, come sit at my table. I have no comprehension of how he's saying that. But I know that he loves us so much, he wants to eat with us. He knows how important food is to us. He's saying, I want to eat with you. So every day, like we said earlier, Eat God. <laughs> may sound really, really foolish, but what he says, you know, he wants to, um, uh, what I do is very simple. When I'm feeling low or unloved, I'll go and I'll kneel before God and I'll say, Lord, show me you love me. And I'll, I'll just give him some, some space and some time to let him pour out his love from the heavens. And then I'll eat it up. And uh, for me, I'm a little visual, so I'll, I will, I'll ask God to show me, you know? So I'll see him opening the gates of heaven, and sometimes he has this big pot of gold, and he pours it like this. And I'll open my mouth and, and drink it all up. And it may sound insane to you, but I feel loved. I feel loved. You can ask him for however way you want to receive this, but he wants to give it to you. Eat his love, eat his grace, his mercy, his provision, his protection, eat it all up. I want you to know I am Jehovah Rapha, he says, the healer. We know for sickness we can ask God for help, but do we know we can ask God help from our traumas? our uh, worries, uh, the things in us that have developed over time, which we feel like that's just how it is, you know, as you get older, you get a little more, you, you say that is life, you know, that's how I am supposed to be. If I have to live and survive in this world, I should know some things. And then when you know those things, you get a little more worried, a little more pessimistic. Can we ask God to heal us there also? We don't have to live a life in worry. We don't have to live a life uh, suspicious. 
when is God going to suddenly do something? I didn't expect. We can ask him to give us security, give us comfort. People in our life have treated us badly. We can ask him for help. God, instead of uh, seeking an expensive counselor or going, to, like, God, give me great friends who will help me out of this. We can always ask for those things, but can we ask God to heal us? To heal us from sin, heal us from addictions, heal us from these crooked ways. God is the healer. Think of him like that. And you will not feel, if there's any fear to approach him, you won't feel that fear. You will be like, my healer, heal me. He's saying, I am your protection and provider. I'm your father, not your foe. Reckless love says that. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. And sometimes we treat God like the enemy, especially when things go wrong. I am so, I've been in, in God for so long, yet when something terrible happens, my first reaction is, oh, how could you do that, God? How could you allow, did I do something wrong? No, what did I do wrong for you to allow this? No, how could you do this to me? It may, it may be from some human being. It may be something that happened to everyone in that city. It does not mean it's from God. How does he suddenly become the enemy when something bad happens? On the contrary, when we were God's enemies, actually, we had disobeyed him, we had lived in sin, we had dishonored him. When we were his enemies, he sent his son, his beloved son who didn't sin, to die in our place. Now, how can we think of him as a foe, as an enemy? He's totally on our side. He, he is more than on our side. He gave up everything for us. I'm your father, not your foe, he says. I will deliver you from every trouble if you come to me. We talked about this in Haven Fellowship today. The escape route. Every situation that has a temptation is common to all man. But the Lord is faithful who will make a way out. I have been in situations where, um, you know, some addiction, too embarrassed to say what addiction, and I'll be in the middle of it and suddenly I'll remember God and I'll say, God, why aren't you getting me out of this? I'm, you know, this is just continuing. He taught me slowly that it's not like an escape route. If, you, if you're in a bus, there's one window sometimes, which says if there's an emergency, you have to break this and go out of that. That window, that, that escape route is not going to break itself and come to you and pull you out and go. You have to go there. So though God can pull you out of the fire by himself, he's saying, come to me. Because sometimes we don't want to go to God. He's not going to, like a rough person, cut us off from our situation. and That can damage something. He wants us to willingly go to him and say, God, help me. And he's saying, if you do that, I, will, I promise you, I will get you out of any trouble in your whole life. It's a lovely promise. And then he talks about health. This is one of our great concerns, especially after the pandemic. I will keep you in good health. That is his promise for us. And then he says something oh, confusing but interesting. He says, till the day you are supposed to know me deeper in sickness. And to be fully known by me after death. <laughs> I don't like this part. He's shown this to me in my life. I, I don't like it at all. But it's like this. Say you're in a concert and there are levels of seats. 
right? You have the, the general seats, then you have the VIP seats, and then you have the VVIP seats. Getting to know God is like getting that ticket through Jesus Christ, and you get into the concert. If you have faith, you're in the concert. That's the only qualification. Sickness is like a VIP seat. It's a privilege. It's, a, it's an unusual situation where you have no choice but to lean on God. And those who follow God in sickness understand the privilege and the blessing and the closeness of God, which is closer than when everything was fine, everything was well, I followed God, I enjoyed. But when I'm sick and I still worship, there's something more intimate about it. Anyone experience that? There's something, there's something closer, which I could not get when I was well. Now, God will not purposely come and you know, give COVID or something like, so that you can come to me. He's not like that. We can trust him. But he's telling us there is a comfort reserved for those who are sick. If you happen to get sick, don't think God has given up on you and he's like, I don't care. You don't deserve to live. No, nothing like that. He is, he is closer to you if you will seek him. So don't fear sickness and don't fear death because uh, like St. Paul says, to live is to know Christ and to die is gain. In fact, he was, he was waiting to die <laughs> towards the end of his life so that he would know God and he'd be freed from this tumultuous life. Everyone's whipping him wherever he goes. They're stoning him wherever he goes. I want to just be with God, please. But he, he holds on for the sake of the disciples. You know, I'm just holding on just so that I can share the word a little more. <laughs> but I'm waiting to meet God. So don't fear sickness or death. Finally, he says, I want you to know me and to be with me all the days of your life. We want this. I know we want this. I know each of us here wants this. It's nice to know that God also wants this. He likes it. He's not just uh, tolerating us. He wants us. That's nice. I go somewhere, like, even coming here, it's, it's nice to know that, that you want me here. It's like really awesome. It's, it's one of the special things. But to know God wants us, <gasps> that's so great. He says now, he's asking for a commitment. He says, I will be waiting for you until you decide you want to give your lives to me. You must if you want to live. I see this like uh, a world on fire, and we can see it burning. We can see the darkness, we can see the tragedies, we can see the death in this world. And God is our escape route. See, he's not saying, uh, unless you obey me, I'll kill you. No, we're already all dying. And he's saying, I'm showing you the way of life. And this way of life, I don't want you to do it once in a way. I don't want you to do, I don't want you to do it twice in a way. I don't want you to do it weekly. I'm asking for everything. Everything. Give me everything. I gave you everything. I didn't give it to you on condition. I gave it to you whether you accept or not. Give me everything. He wants us to live. That's what I'm understanding. He wants us desperately to live. He wants us to have life. I was sharing with some students earlier this week. Some of us don't want to live. Like really, like underneath, we're like, I don't care, you know. When God takes me, awesome. I don't know, I'm just kind of passing my life here. Just eat, sleep, repeat kind of thing. Uh, the best time I have is worshipping God, but I don't really care for myself and nobody really cares for me, etc., etc. The life God has is not this kind of life where everything is broken and, and, and no matter how hard you work, 
things may or may not work out, the life God has for us is in a place where there's no suffering, no pain, no death. There's no Satan, thank God. <laughs> there's no this flesh, thank God. New bodies, new closeness, a new heaven and a new earth. It's a good life. It's a really good life. Anybody who had it would want to be in there forever. So we can trust him on that. He may not show us the blueprint now. This is how it's going to be. You're going to sit in this room. This is going to be your mansion. Do you sign or not sign? He's saying, trust me. You trust me and you follow me all the days of your life. I will give you every day a taste of what that's going to be like. We don't have eternal life only in heaven. We have it now also. When we follow Jesus, we taste that eternity now. I taste him when I was worshipping with y'all. Eternal love. Eternal peace that passes all understanding. So do we make a commitment today? Can we give everything we've got? Like, I know that we have already given our lives to Jesus. I'm sure most of us here, going by the way we were, you know, pouring ourselves in worship to him. Uh, I sense that most of us love Jesus, want him. But whatever been, you've been holding back, you're a little unsure about that area. Whatever you've been hiding from God, you're like, uh, God, I let you have my spirituality, but I'm not sure about my health. You know, whatever it is, can we just open it to him? Tell him right now. Tell him, pray to him, and dedicate. Open up to him. And say, God, I give it to you. God, I give it to you. I give myself to you. I give my life to you. Every day, every moment. I give my thoughts to you. I give my worship to you. I will not worship anything else. I will not worship myself and my ways. I will worship you. Your ways, your words over my words. Your ways over others. Your work over my work. What you have to show me over what I want to see. I give it to you, Lord. I accept whatever you have been telling me. And if I have questions, I pray that you will make me understand your answers. I give you my questions, Lord. There's some things that are holding me back that I don't know how to overcome. I want to, but I'm feeling scared. Can you reassure me now? Can you help me trust you? I have never trusted like this in my life. Can you help me trust you? You promised that you would help me that you would deliver me, that you would cause your face to shine upon me and give me peace. So I believe. I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe in his death for me. I believe you rose him from the dead. I believe you can do this for me also. I believe you can set me free from sins and give me a life that is dedicated to you alone. I believe you have given me the spirit of power and love and self-control that I no longer have to sin any longer. Teach me the way, O oh God. Help me follow your spirit all the days of my life. I look forward to be with you in your house forever. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen.
Amen.